This video was made possible thanks to the support from my patrons. Pledge today and you can be involved in what videos get made next and also get early access to them. Link in the description. It's Doctor Who's Diamond Anniversary, 60 years of time and space. It all started off as a mild curiosity in a junkyard, and when we last left Doctor Who, Jodie Whittaker was regenerating on the Dorset coast. However, something's gone a bit wibbly, as the Doctor's new incarnation is played by 10th Doctor actor, David Tennant. Clearly, we've got a bridge leading us to the next incarnation, played by Shuti Gatwa, which are taking the form of a trio of 60th anniversary specials, written by returning showrunner Russell T. Davis. The show is now under the stewardship of Bad Wolf Studios, the first time Doctor Who has been out of the BBC's hands, apart from the 1996 TV movie. They have been insanely busy over the past year, expanding the profile of the show, culminating in the Hooniverse expanded universe of companion show and specials to celebrate the franchise. Tales from the TARDIS, which sees old Doctors and companions reminisce on old adventures, the return of a making of show in Doctor Who Unleashed, a colour version of the Daleks, a Children in Need prequel, as well as the 14th Doctor's adventures to Planet Bedtime Stories. No, that wasn't a joke. I've landed on Planet Bedtime Stories! Yes, this is real, and I think it's canon. So the 14th Doctor and his friends have been very busy, but now we're getting to the main event, The Star Beast, a loose adaptation of a Doctor Who comic strip from the late 1970s. But with returning companion Donna Noble, played by Catherine Tate, there's obviously more going on with this hour-long special. So let's dive in. The 14th Doctor lands in Camden Market, right next to Donna Noble and her daughter Rose, who's played by Yasmin Finney. It's been 15 years since the Doctor wiped her memory to save her from the Metacrisis incident in Series 4, but that's not all he has to worry about. A spaceship crashes nearby with an escape pod harboring the Meep an adorable furry creature voiced by Miriam Margulies, who is evading the monstrous Wrath Warriors. It's up to the Doctor to save the Meep, whilst also ensuring that he doesn't cause the death of his best friend, who is somehow at the centre of all of these events. It's been 15 years since we last saw David Tennant and Catherine Tate together in Doctor Who, and while it's great to see that these two haven't missed a beat in these roles, it's the texture of their acting and also Russell T. Davis's script that makes it feel like a credible reunion. Obviously, you're not going to bring back David Tennant and have him act completely unlike the incarnation that made him, and to an extent the show itself, a household name in the 21st century, but there's enough here to mark 14 as a departure from what he did before. There's definitely a more relaxed approach, with body language indicating a quiet confidence, along with joy seeming to come way easier to him. The heavy burden of being the last of the Time Lords, gone. The Doctor's first story in a while, where the universe or the Earth isn't in danger, at least to start with. Just a fun romp around London with a crashed spaceship and an adorable meep. However, while Tennant is great, I actually think that Catherine Tate is giving the more interesting performance. It's fascinating to see her try and thread the needle by depicting a Donna Noble who, spiritually, is more akin to the Donna in The Runaway Bride, before her adventures with the Doctor. Neris. Well, now it all makes sense. That viper in the nest. Whilst also being, well, 15 years older and wiser, she has a teenage daughter who she would burn the world down to protect. She seems to have a healthier relationship with her mother, and her husband Sean, played by Carl Collins, is... is just great. What do I care? Got the best two girls in the world, mate. Also, I love how actively invested Donna is in her daughter's toy business. Like, she even knows about some of her specific buyers. A woman from Abu Dhabi who buys your stuff, she'd love that one. <gasps> She's obsessed with gonks. Grown woman. With gonks. But Donna still has flashes of memories of her time with the Doctor. She still gets the sense that something is missing, wonderfully articulated in this talk with her mum. But some nights, I lie in bed thinking, what have I lost? 
I think Russell T Davis is attempting to tap into a collective unease in the country at the moment. It could be the rose-tinted, pun intended, perspective on the past and nostalgia, but looking at what we believed was possible, and what we were collectively feeling in 2008 compared to 2023, it feels like, as a country, we're weaker, poorer, and more damaged. Financial crisis after financial crisis and a failed political ideology in charge has objectively worsened our material conditions. How Donna and the rest of the noble family were left with a winning lottery ticket in 2008, but now can't even afford to run their house, which is making this metatext into the actual text of the story. Obviously, this is not a universal truism, but I think it's part of a deliberate attempt by Russell T. Davis to tap into the populist approach that he has been implementing in Doctor Who as far back as 2005, but that's a topic for another time. It's been 15 years for the Noble family, but it's great to see that they haven't remained static. These are still the same people, but they're not the same people, if that makes sense. There's a familiarity, but it's not a copy-paste from 2008, which this so easily could have been. Shout out to Jacqueline King as Grandmother Sylvia, who is trying so so very, very hard to protect her daughter from the Doctor, even managing to prevent what could have just been a violence against men is funny joke by slapping the Doctor and making it work by embodying a mother bear, something we did not see her do back in 2008. She is the straight person in this insane comedy of errors. The meep is in the shed at the back of the house, the Doctor is knocking on the front door, and Sylvia is trapped in the middle. No, it isn't. No, no, he's not there. You can't see him. And there's no monster. Oh, but the love of God, none of this is real. Jacqueline King feels like she's giving a completely different performance to everyone else in the cast, but I mean that in the best way possible. But yeah, let's talk about that meep in the room. So in 1979, we saw the publication of Doctor Who Weekly, which years later would become Doctor Who magazine and released monthly. Doctor Who Weekly would have weekly comic strips with the Star Beast being one of the first. It's a fourth Doctor and K-9 story where the Doctor is kidnapped by the Wraith Warriors, a bomb is implanted in his stomach without him knowing, and he's led to Earth to self-destruct next to the cuddly meat a lost alien adopted by two human teenagers. It's pretty bonkers. Oh, and K-9 thinks he's a cat in this story. No, that was not a joke. In the TV version, there's less setting of the scene, with the Wraith Warriors and their specific deal being left until much later in the TV version. And instead of two teenagers finding the cuddly meep, it's Rose Noble, who hides the meep in her back garden shed where she makes cuddly toys. Interestingly, the idea of a cute, friendly alien being found by kids would later be a format that would see great success with Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial a couple of years later. And we see that inspiration come full circle with the Meep hiding amongst Rose's toys in the shed. The Meep is so much fun in the first half of the story. Miriam Margulies is giving an almost pathetic performance as something so desperate to be loved. Please, pretty lady, please, please like the me. The I'm sorry. Look away. Look away. Oh, 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 I know. It isn't real. Please. And it's clear in hindsight just how much the Meep is layering on the schmaltz. The Meep claims to be all alone and can see something in Rose that they can relate to. Unfortunately, we can't spend much time with that, however, because the plot has to kick in and the Doctor has to reunite with Donna. While the Star Beast comic strip, an eight-parter in its original short comic strip format amounting to around 34 pages, it's not a particularly complicated story, and you can tell that the template of it was used for the Star Beast, but not much else. We later learn that the Meep is not only evil, but is super incredibly evil, like Disney evil. And while Miriam is still great and fun in the role in the second half of the story, the Meep has definitely been toned down from its original original depiction in the comic strip, where it has such fun, aggressive, and hilarious thought bubbles and rationale. Obviously, this TV version can't adapt thought bubbles faithfully, but even so, the Meep as a villain is way more generic in this adaptation, to the detriment of the episode in my opinion. For crying out loud, in the original comic strip they do a Disney song parody, but it's turned on its head with the evil Meep. 
Why is that not here? You have Disney endorsement. It's a perfect lineup. And this is how we get a bit of a compromised episode overall. You've got this Star Beast adaptation and a reunion story for the Doctor and Donna, which needs to find a way to overcome the very plot specific reason why these two cannot be together again, whilst also setting up a new TARDIS, establishing new characters who look set to return in future, like Rose and also Shirley Ann Bingham, Unit's new scientific advisor played by Ruth Madeley. But because these two plots don't seem to naturally go together, you can spot a lot of contrivances just to make it work. Despite being surrounded by unit soldiers marching and shouting, the Doctor somehow manages to hear Donna Noble from at least a hundred yards away and runs to investigate, and no one from unit follows him. The Doctor's sonic screwdriver has received an insane upgrade. The Sheffield Steel one from the 13th Doctor was destroyed by the Daleks in the Doctor Who magazine comic strip liberation of the daleks so he gets a new one and this one can create projection screens bring the wraith warriors to him with no setup and also creates force fields that can maintain their shape under stress for a few minutes yes it's a cool moment to have the doctor just through muscle memory hand the screwdriver to donna during this scene but I'm worried we're going to have scenes in future episodes where we'll be watching and thinking, sure would have been great to have a barrier here, Doctor. It's cool tech, but this thing is clearly overpowered just for the plot, even more so than previous sonic screwdrivers. Another contrivance is Shirley coming in clutch at the end, somehow evading capture from dozens of brainwashed unit soldiers. Though it's got to be said, I love how unit is carrying on the tradition of hiding weapons in mobility assisting kits. It. Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart would have been proud. Obviously, I'm nitpicking here, but you can start to see the mechanics of the plot trying very, very hard to force the Doctor and Donna into that room at the end. And I don't think there was really enough time at the end for the conclusion, which is why it has to lean so hard into the power of love and self assurance to win the day. The issue with that is that while Yasmin Finney does a great job as the wide eyed, awkward teenager who makes friends with an alien that she finds by the bins, the story basically forgets about her for a pretty large chunk. When the meep does its heel turn and reveals itself to be just a, just a piece of work, there's no reaction from Rose. The camera does not even cut to her, despite her being present in the scene when it happens. Yeah, she does react later on when she's called a weird child. You stupid woman with your weird child. But it comes across to me at least as, oh, I was fine with you betraying my trust and manipulating me and my whole family, but I draw the line at transphobia. Like, come on. Going back to E.T., it would be like if, sorry, spoiler alert for a 40-year-old movie, but it would be like if when E.T. dies near the end, there's no reaction from Elliot. No, that's the key emotional beat of the story, in this case, the Star Beast adaptation. And it's, it's, it's just not here. Instead, the scene after the underground car park trial is solely dedicated to Donna. And yeah, that's important, but there isn't an integration of multiple character threads here, something that Russell is usually so incredibly good at doing. It means that when Rose does get included at the end, it doesn't really feel earned in a narrative sense. It's a shame, because the Meep being such a master manipulator is actually really well set up. Yes, the Meep spots Rose's loneliness and uses it to try and get close to her, but the Meep also works as a mirror to the Doctor. Both have two hearts, both default to a gender neutral title and both are able to hide a dark interior through a cute and fluffy exterior until great violence needs to be enacted. A deeper meaning in the text that unfortunately gets diluted by people watching as the doctor assuming pronouns or whatever. Never mind that gender neutral or gender non-conforming aliens have been a named and explicit thing in the show for at least 50 years. Or is he a she? Neither. She's an it. It's a hermaphrodite hexapod. Look, not that I'm calling you a lady, but I don't know, you might be. Incidentally, happy 50th anniversary to the Sontarans. God, the Time Warrior was half a century ago? What is life? What is time? You have a primary and secondary reproductive cycle. It is an inefficient system, you should change it. 
Obviously, the Star Beast, down to its original adaptation, is going for a don't judge by appearances story, with the cuddly Meep being an evil destroyer of worlds, while the Wrath Warriors are actually shooting to stun, and have incredibly polite and ordinary voices. I love these guys, I just want to grab a beer with them. Incidentally, it's funny that the 14th Doctor just has a judge's wig in his jacket. When his clothes regenerated about an hour ago, did the wig come pre-installed, or did he quickly grab it from the TARDIS wardrobe after his trip to Planet Bedtime Stories. Yes, I still think that's canon. Either way, it's a fun callback to the season 16 story, The Stones of Blood, where the fourth Doctor does exactly the same thing. Your Honours, I'm sure that my witness wishes to withdraw that last remark, don't you? Yes, absolutely the same time, Lord. But it's not just the classic series that this story takes inspiration from. I got the sense that even after leaving the show 13 years ago after the end of time, Russell T. Davis did not stop watching the show. Yes, there's Chibnall era inspirations of increased diversity on and off camera, we've got what appears to be a Lupari plush toy in Rose's shed, but there's also the Moffat inspirations, from the connection of the Doctor choosing his own name along with Rose, but also the incredibly sincere heart over head resolution akin to the series 5 finale, where Amy Pond is able to drag the Doctor back into existence by remembering him on the day of her wedding. Or with the ending of Hell Bent, where Clara is also given godlike status alongside the Doctor, but in a deliberate reversal to Journey's End, the Doctor gets his memories wiped instead, and Clara gets to keep the power, and the freedom. If you can go along with those, then I'd argue that, in principle, you should be on board with Donna and Rose's fate in this story, but I will admit that the series 5 finale in particular gave that ending way more time to breathe. Here, Donna's supposed death is just given zero time to feel credible to the audience, and Rose and Donna just letting go of the Metacrisis powers genuinely feels like a cop-out. I get the parallel of Donna giving all of her money away to be more like the Doctor, and then giving up the Metacrisis to be more like herself along with her daughter, but I, I think this needed spelling out a bit more logistically and thematically. It feels like an ass pull, especially when combined with Rose being so underwritten in the episode that what should be a triumphant self-acceptance line... After all these years, I'm finally me. It falls flat. We we didn't even know that was an issue for you. It's literally never come up. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. We've got all that power, but there is a way to get rid of it. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. Just let it go. The Doctor was a woman a few hours ago. What are you even on about? So much for the Doctor supposedly remembering everything. You can remember that Donna takes her coffee with cold milk and recall every day of her after all of these centuries, but you can't remember to a couple of hours ago? Okay, sure. Was the 10th Doctor so self-absorbed in the Series 4 finale that he never even considered that Donna could just let go of the power? Don't misunderstand me, however. This is more just me being confused by the execution. This is likely just fun jabs between friends, akin to Donna insulting the Doctor's dress sense or the time. If you're angry at this ending and taking it super seriously, I think that says a lot more about you than the episode, personally. But like I said, a lot of this comes from Rose being underwritten. Yes, there's the great scene of Sylvia not really understanding but trying to be supportive. We also have the scene of the teenage boys dead naming and insulting Rose in the street. Now, there's pros and cons to the inclusions of these scenes, but notice how Rose is the subject, but she's not very active in those scenes. A lot of the stuff is happening around her, and we're actually learning very little about Rose herself. Obviously, people can contain multitudes, and I think it's worthwhile to depict these realities of transitioning, but Sylvia isn't the one with the self-acceptance speech at the end. It's Rose. She's a trans teenager who is creative and makes toys to help support the family, but what else? She's barely a character. And Rose's school play? Well, maybe not that. She can't act. She's terrible. I don't know how to tell her. Yeah, funny gag, but once again, Rose is a character that's spoken about, but doesn't seem to have much to say or do 
for herself. She doesn't even get involved in the resolution until the meta crisis kicks in. She demonstrates no agency beforehand in the steelworks. There's been some really interesting discussions since broadcast about whether or not dead naming should even be depicted on screen or depicting family teething issues like Sylvia has. I am, obviously, not an authority here, but being a bystander to these conversations has been incredibly fascinating. With Rose, this could genuinely be the first openly trans character that audiences see on screen, and that opens the door to several conversations. Even in 2023, I struggle to think of other shows that display queer representation this openly on a show as big as Doctor Who, on platforms as big as the BBC in the UK, or Disney Plus internationally, so perhaps going broad is the best way to go about it? But due to the relative newness of trans representation, the decades worth of forced, often mandated exclusion, particularly on mainstream platforms, so there will obviously be stumbles, there will obviously be well-meaning misfires. We may look back at the Star Beast in 10 years time and cringe, comparing it to much better representation in the near future. Kind of like how we look back at the previous trans representation in Doctor who, in the end of the world and in sleep no more. Maybe something like dead naming in 10 years time will be deemed as an absolute no in media, but who knows? The first ambassadors are rarely the most refined, but because representation for certain communities is so rare, examples like this get a level of hyperfixation or hyper-awareness which dilutes the discourse. Take Shirley Ann Bingham, played by Ruth Madeley. It's so rare to see a positive example of such an overt disabled character in a show as large as Doctor Who, evidenced by people being genuinely confused and, in some cases, irrationally angry at seeing a wheelchair user cross their legs. Evidence, not that more was needed, on the importance of representation just for basic education. Ruth Madeley has collaborated with Russell T. Davis before. Heck, she's even a sixth Doctor companion in the world of Big Finish, marine biologist Hebe Harrison, in a storyline where a Jordan Peterson eugenicist type uses time travel to remove undesirable disabled people from history. But that's another story. It would not surprise me if lines like this... Sorry about the stairs, but Geneva says to go in immediately. Don't make me the problem, just get in there. You've got weapons in your wheelchair. We all have. Come on. Were actually suggested by Ruth. Like I said, she's had a working relationship with Russell before. We need to remember that making media is a collaborative process. Just one second of broadcast television requires the creative input from sometimes hundreds of individuals on multiple, often invisible levels. Maybe the dead naming scene for Rose was something that Yasmin Finney advocated for or had input in. I don't know, but I think that we shouldn't remove the agency of those involved in the creative process. But regardless of how it wound up on screen, it's clear that a lot of thought has actually gone into how we see characters like Rose, characters like Shirley, how they're depicted, and as it looks like we're going to be seeing more of them in the near future, in future episodes, I hope we get to learn more about them, and the stories can actively involve them more. The resolution of the story, the Doctor using the trigger words to essentially reactivate Donna, that's great stuff. I love the detail of there being 13 trigger words, and Donna does not start copying the Doctor until the 10th. Very nice touch. And Donna instantly agrees to sacrifice herself to save her family and London. No, this is not the same Donna who saved the whole of creation in Journey's End, but this is the Donna who saved the Doctor from himself in The Runaway Bride, who sacrificed herself in turn left. But like I said, I wish that the Doctor and Donna, their climactic scene, just had way more time to breathe. These two are acting their asses off, but it feels so rushed. I just, no. No, you are not. Why does it have to be this? I feel like that line on its own could have been the focus of, like, another full scene. But, is the Star Beast able to work as a standalone adventure, or as a continuation of the original 2008 stories? Honestly, I've seen the episode multiple times, and I'm still not quite sure. The opening exposition feels so clunky, and pretty hackneyed if I'm honest, not helped by the 14th Doctor floating in a cheap void that looks like an RPG character creator. Are you a boy? Or a girl? Or neither?
Rose could have acted as an interesting point of view character, a 2023 equivalent of young Amelia Pond finding an alien in the garden, but that's dropped pretty quickly. While The Star Beast is a fun hour of TV filled with great set pieces, terrific dialogue with textured, multifaceted scenes that are able to establish tone, character, and move the plot forward, I mean, Ross T. Davis is one of the best in the business at this stuff, it feels like a bit of a shell of an episode. A bunch of great ideas, but not fully formed. An end goal goal in mind to get us to the twist with the Meep and the Dr. Donna reunited, the partners in crime coming back, but doing anything it can, even if it comes to compromising the story, to get us to that end state and damn everything else. I think that once we get away from the hype of the 60th anniversary, I'm not going to be in a rush to rewatch or revisit this one, unlike Rose or The 11th Hour, where I am still finding new things to love and appreciate them all of these years later. By comparison, The Star Beast feels a bit empty. While it's hard to know for sure if we really have gone back to 2008 again, it's safe to say that the production does feel thoroughly modern. The dream logic and fairy tale inclinations was not the only thing that Russell borrowed from Stephen Moffat's era, but he also brought in one of Moffat's most acclaimed directors. Death in Heaven, Heaven Sent, and Ward Enough in Time director Rachel Talalay sets the standard for the 60th anniversary with an incredibly vibrant looking story. From the bustling Camden market to the massive and intimidating steelworks, the Star Beast feels big, even if there's only a handful of locations and most of the key scenes are just dialogue heavy exchanges in small rooms. We've got the street battle between Unit and the Wraith Warriors, often framed from a child's window, to our heroes having to sneak past a sleeping neighbour. These are all given weight, without losing touch of the human element. Great scene transitions, fun framing of the meep throughout the serial, and the confidence to just let the camera linger and allow the cast to do their best work. It's also insane just how good the meep looks. A seamless combination of a furry, practical costume mixed with convincing facial animations. Going through the footage from Doctor Who Unleashed, it's kind of amazing just how much of the meep in the second half of the episode is practical. It's also so good to see Pat Mills and Dave Gibbons' names front and centre for their work on the 1979 comic strip. In a climate where companies like Disney or Warner Brothers giving appropriate credit for those who created some of their biggest film properties and characters is like pulling teeth, it's depressingly admirable to see Bad Wolf booking that trend and actually putting these creatives on a pedestal over 40 years later. I will say though, I'm curious as to whether or not there's a slightly longer cut of the Star Beast out there, because the ending reveal where it's shown that Rose inherited the Meta Crisis from Donna, it's full of moments that get no setup. Those plush toys from the Doctor and Donna's adventures, they're cute, but literally none of them appear in the scenes earlier in Rose's shed. Not even as a fun background detail or easter egg. We never get a good enough look at the shed to hint at it resembling the TARDIS early on, and even Rose being non-binary, that's not set up either. Rose is such an afterthought in this episode that even the big, oh it was in plain sight ending, that delivery, it didn't even put the clues in the audience's sight, it felt like a cheat. But aside from that, it's a terrific looking production from top to bottom. Murray Gold returns as composer after several years away, and aside from the elating triumphant music when the Doctor and Donna set foot in the new TARDIS, a lot of it feels very familiar. Obviously, it's the same composer, and there's going to be a lot of recurring motifs like I'm the Doctor, the Doctor's theme, etc., but I just mean in general. This is definitely the same composer from 15 years ago, for better or for worse. The brand new theme tune for the 60th anniversary is... Yep, it's a Murray Gold Doctor Who theme with a dash of Pirates of the Caribbean thrown in there, and once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Speaking of titles, I actually do love the new intro, with the police box almost surfing the vortex before being flung around. It's a departure from previous revived series openers, but I think it calls back to the Seventh Doctor's opening, where it's not so much space or the vortex, but something more grandiose visually. Aside from the logo's implementation, it's literally just a swirling PNG. I like it a lot. As for the new TARDIS, it's big. Really big. You can absolutely tell that this is the same production designer who worked on the 2005 Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie, specifically the Heart of Gold spaceship. 
Phil Simms, who also worked on other great sci-fi productions like Guardians of the Galaxy and The Martian, is a huge get for this new era of Doctor Who, and I cannot wait to see his upcoming work. But yeah, the different coloured lights seem to offer an insane amount of options. I love the ramps, and the sheer size of the set means that you can fly drones inside of it to get different shots and angles. But damn is it empty. I sure hope that it becomes more homely and ends up feeling a bit more lived in, because otherwise all of that size is just going to waste. I liked the return of the food and drinks processor though, very first Doctor. Alright, bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs, yes. Yeah. I hope mine doesn't taste of engine grease. No, no, no. no. Hmm, not bad. But of course, Donna is inside of the TARDIS for about two minutes and already spills coffee all over it, sending her and the Doctor hurtling through time and space into the unknown. Yeah, like I said earlier, there's clearly an end point and Russell is going to get to it no matter what it takes credibility-wise. And that's why I like but don't love the Star Beast as an episode. It's fun entertainment and obviously introductory episodes are rarely where anyone involved does their best work, but what we do have here is a story at war with itself in terms of competing plots and narratives. The Meep plot winds up detracting from the Doctor and Donna reunion and Rose's story arc feels completely dropped in order to give Donna more time to show shine, which unfortunately amounts to a bunch of half measures. I think its parts amount to more than the whole, however. Fun visuals, great performances across the board, and lovely little flourishes that make the Star Beast a good new debut, but might be considered a bit of a step backwards in the grand scheme of things. The Doctor Donna is back, for better or for worse. So let's see what time and space has in store for them. Join me next time as the TARDIS runs away, leaving the 14th Doctor and Donna in uncharted territory in Wild Blue Yonder. I'll see you then. Hey folks, and happy 60th birthday to Doctor Who. Thank you for watching my review of The Star Beast. Let me know what you thought of the story down in the comment section below. Also, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. It can massively help to support the channel. I've got loads of big projects planned for the future, so if you want to keep updated on all of those, subscribing is the best way to do it. Another good way to support me is by supporting me on Patreon. My patrons got early access to this review. They get their names in the credits. You can see them, these beautiful gits. And I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Ben Langdon, Tuba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver-Bousinger, Dean Jones, Dylan Whitaker, Air Hoovian, Ginger Animator, Jack D. Evans, Joseph Adams, Lard Dragon Ezra, Leela, Maria Bergman, Marianne Mogensen, Mario Fanboy 15, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nick M, Palex, Pat Andrews, Randall Sprinkle, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Sam Montgomery, Samuel Whitaker, Samuel Davis, Sarah Parker Shemilt, The Evil Dalek, The Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu-ray Reviews, The Raggedy Jedi, The Scarlet Watcher, Toby Loxton, Will, and Yevnu. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, thanks to you for watching, and I'll see you all next time.